Good morning, everyone. I'm Paul Smedberg, chair of the WMATA board. Thank you for being here today at our board of directors meeting. I'll turn the floor over to the senior director for safety assurance, Greg Kupka, for today's safety contact. Greg, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to Metro headquarters. We don't have any drills planned today, but in the event of an alarm, we're going to exit through the doors, gather in the hallway, and follow the instructions of the security staff. In the event of a medical emergency, there's an AED located right out in the hallway, and the restrooms are also located in the hallway. Moving on to the safety contact, WMATA is committed to ensuring all stations, buses, and rail cars are accessible. Each rail station has an elevator and accessible fare vending machine with lower panels and extra wide accessible fare gates for customers who use mobility devices. Additionally, all WMATA buses are accessible with two wheelchair securement areas, and each Metrobus operator is trained on their use. Metrobus operators are required to ask you if you want to be secured, but allow you to decide. If you request help with securement, the operator must provide assistance to you. A seatbelt and shoulder harness are also available in each wheelchair, wheelchair securement lo location on the bus. You may request help with a seatbelt and sh shoulder harness, but you are not required to use these restraints. For Metro Rail, ADA does not require and Metro does not provide wheelchair tie downs on rail cars. You can ride safely on the train with the without these, but however, to put your wheelchair, uh, however, remember to put your wheelchair parking brake on while riding. Elevators are the safest ways for persons who use wheelchairs to access the Metro Rail station. Uh, Metro elevators have security cameras and emergency intercoms so that you can contact the station manager if needed. There are two important phone numbers regarding station elevators. The first is 202-6962-1212. Again, that's 202-962-1212, which provides the latest information on elevator outages. The second phone number is 202-962-1825, which puts you in direct contact with the Metrobus shuttle service, which operates when elevators are out of order. Additionally, additional safety tips and more information can be found in the Customer Guide to Metrobus and Metrorail for People with Disabilities and Senior Citizens, which is available at WMATA.com as a PDF or in audio format. That's all I have, sir. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Greg. Since this is our first public meeting of the day, I'll ask our board corporate secretary, Jennifer Ellison, to please call the roll. Thank you, Chair Smedberg. Present. Vice Chair Babers. Present. Vice Chair Drummer. Present. Ms. Klein. Present. Mr. Letourneau. Present. Dr. Lowe. Present. Andrew. Present. Ms. Martin Proctor. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You have a quorum. Thank you. Now we'll have move on to the approval of the agenda. If there are no objections, I'd like to consider the agenda approved as presented. Does anyone have any objections? Hearing none, the agenda is approved as presented. Now to the approval of the minutes. We have three sets of minutes for approval. Board meetings from uh, March 23rd and April 14th as well as an executive session of April 14th. I'd like to consider these minutes approved as presented. Does anyone have any objections or comments on any of those sets of minutes? Hearing none, the minutes are, are, are approved. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to the employee spotlight. Before I begin with the employee spotlight, I would like to recognize April as Autism Acceptance Month. This month provides an opportunity to celebrate and acknowledge the unique talents and abilities of those with autism. It is also a time for us to reflect on how we can create a more inclusive workplace. Autism is a condition that affects millions of people around the world. It is a neurodegenerative condition that uh, can impact uh, social interactions, communication, and behavior. However, it is important to note that autism is not a disability but rather a different way of processing information and experiencing the world. As an organization, we strive to create a welcoming and inclusive environment for all of our employees. This includes those with autism. By recognizing and embracing the diversity of our time, we can foster a culture of acceptance and understanding. This not only benefits those with autism, but it also leads to a more productive and innovative workplace. We encourage all employees to take the time to learn more about autism and how we can support those with this condition. We also encourage our team to engage in conversations and activities that promote acceptance and understanding. I'd like to thank the Metro family for, our, for their continued support in creating an inclusive and welcoming workplace for all. And thank you to the general manager, members of our operations team, customer engagement, and the Metropolitan, Police, uh, Metropolitan Transit Police Department for your participation in a wonderful transit day for children with autism. Uh, as I move into the employee spotlight, we are recognizing two uh, individuals and one team uh, effort this month. 
I'd also like to note that we'll do photos at the end uh, once we've concluded recognizing each group. First, fire station, uh, fire station, station manager, uh, Everett Rogers. Everett, would you please stand? Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to thank you on behalf of the board for courageously administering life-saving procedures to a Metro customer who collapsed at the Van Dorn Street station earlier this month. On April 7th, with less than three months on the job, Station Manager Rogers encountered a customer who had fallen to the ground in medical distress. The customer was unresponsive and was not breathing. After quickly assessing the situation, Mr. Rogers retrieved the station's automatic external defibrillator, an AED, and upon direction, provided cycles of CPR. Mr. Rogers' actions sustained the customer until the Alexandria Fire Department arrived on the scene and thanks to his action, emergency personnel were able to regain a pulse. The customer was then transported to Alexandria Inova Hospital for additional medical treatment. Mr. Rogers' life-saving actions demonstrate careful attention to the procedures outlined in the station manager training. We know that time is precious in these types of situations, so we applaud Mr. Rogers for being there in the right place at the right time and for his heroic skills that saved the life of a customer. I left one thing out that was in my report. When fire department 10, I believe unit 10, was it unit 210, when they took over from me, they were working on them. They were having a hard time. So what I did was I backed up. Now and I hear the word pray for the man. Once I started praying, I called out for God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. That's when the man got a pause. So... Glory goes to God on that. Thank you, Mr. Next, we'll honor uh, train operator Shawnee Mitchell. Shawnee, good morning. On April 10th, at approximately 11.30 a.m., train operator Shawnee Mitchell was operating a Blue Plus train from Huntington to New Carrollton. As she left Potomac Avenue and approached Stadium Armory at slow speed that was requested by the Rail Operations Control Center, she noticed bolts and screws scattered on the track bed between the running rails. Operator Mitchell immediately came to a stop and notified central uh, control of her discovery. Thanks to her reporting, further investigation revealed that those bolts were missing from the track in that area. Without Ms. Mitchell's discovery and reporting of the unsafe rail condition, we could have experienced a cascading problem throughout the system. Her knowledge, her solid safety knowledge and quick thinking made a huge difference in avoiding a major incident. Today, join us in thanking Ms. Mitchell for putting safety first. Her keen attention to details helped to avert a dangerous situation and major rail service disruption. Would you like to say something? Yeah, yeah, please say. I wanted to say on that day, um, there was a train, two trains in front of me. The first train, when they left Potomac Avenue, she reported a big bang so loud, the customers were alarmed. So Central Control, after she had made her way through that section of track, told the next train, to go at a restricted speed, no greater than 15 miles an hour, and report her findings. She said that between a section of track from one point to the other, her train shook profusely. So now I'm the third person going through. Already it put me on alert that there was something truly wrong with the section of track ahead of me, 
So I was unnerved about going through that section. So I slowed my train as slow as I could take it. And like he said, I believe it was angels that pointed out those bolts on the railroad because it's something that you don't expect to see every day. I just noticed there was something shiny in the roadway. So I stopped my train, I stood up, I looked through the bulkhead doors, and I saw something very frightening. It was so many boats that I knew that that section of rail, that running rail, was not I didn't feel safe taking my train. I believe it is SOP 1.79 that the train operator has a sole responsibility for the safety of themselves, the passengers, and to protect WMATA's equipment and to avoid injury or death. So I knew that that was a potential. So I told Central I didn't feel safe doing that. They were kind of alarmed that I was reporting that there were boats on the railroad, so they asked me to repeat. Again, I repeated, I don't feel safe taking my train through the section of track because I see, and I started counting, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They exceeded the distance of a running a running board, the running rail cover, which is 10 feet. And I could see them beyond that amount. So, of course, they told me to hold my location. And then they began to reverse the trains behind me so that I, too, could reverse my train and not enter that unsafe area. I'm so curious to know what happened in that section of track because had the angels not <laughs> stopped my train, and I truly believe that because the first two train oper operators didn't catch it, or perhaps it didn't happen until the second train went through. Nonetheless, it could have been a very bad situation, so I'm thankful to have saved myself, others, <laughs> and damage to a modern property, especially the trains that I love to operate. So thank you for your recognition for that. Thank you. And finally, uh, we'd like to call on the 16 employees who are being recognized for their leadership, dedication, and contributions to our fiscal year 2024 budget development and engagement process. Would the following employees please stand? Renee Ciancola, Outreach Manager. Good morning, Renee. Viola Davies, Senior Director of Operating Budget. Dante Frank, uh, I'm sorry, Dante Hamilton, Financial Communications Analyst. Serene Khalid, Auto Visual Production Team. There we are. Mark uh, Irvine, Director of Strategic Initiatives. Marcus Markle, Strategic Communications Manager. Dante Parker, Audio Visual Production Team. John Pasek, Deputy Board Secretary. Adam Paul, Assistant Director of Bus Rail Service Planning and Scheduling. Jose Reyes, Board Program Manager. Lisa Schooley, Director of Planned Project Communications. David So, Director of Financial uh, Reporting. Erica Taylor, Board Executive Administrative Specialist. Matthew Tingstrom, Senior Director of Management Analysts and Planning. Erica Thompson, Director of Capital Planning and Program Development. Catherine Vanderwart, Director of Strategic Intelligence and Analysis. Your work contributed uh, to the approval of our $4.8 billion capital and operating budget that began July 1st, 2023. The budget supports increased bus, bus and rail service, simplifies fares for customers, creates a new low income fare program, caps metro access fares at $4, furthers the Better Bus Initiative, and enhances safety measures. The board extends its thanks and appreciation for your timeless efforts to draft the budget proposal and fund priority initiatives, gather feedback from the board and community partners and our customers, and reflect this impact in our final budget. Your work enabled us to obtain support for and approve a budget that represents Metro's commitment to provide safe, reliable, affordable, and sustainable service throughout the region. Thank you all so much uh, on behalf of the board and everyone uh, 
and all the jurisdictional staff too. I know we you interact with them a lot, or, or we do anyway, and I know some of you do as well. And I know it means an awful lot to them to have that kind of collaborative relationship with you all as we get through this process. So thank you. So now we'll have the board uh, and join up front. We'll do each group of uh, honorees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now we'll move on to our public comment and reports by our advisory boards. We have one person who submitted an online comment, so I'll ask staff to please play that one first. Good afternoon. My name is Kevin O'Brien, and I am here today on behalf of the Washington Area Bicyclist Association and its 6,000 members across the capital region. Our mission for over 50 years is to empower people to ride bikes, build connections, and transform places. We envision a just and sustainable transportation system where walking, biking, and transit are the best ways to get around. Bikes and transit are a winning recipe for our affordable and sustainable mobility across the region. Bikes, whether shared or personal, are the perfect tool for the first and last mile of a transit journey. Since 2019, WMATA has welcomed full-size bicycles on trains at all hours where space allows. We and our members are so grateful for this change. While most Bike Plus Metro trips take advantage of bike parking and capital bike share at stations, 
the flexibility to bring a personal bike on the train has proved transformative for so many people, including myself. Biking to and from Metro on each end of a trip greatly expands the reach of transit and can be quicker and more flexible than navigating bus connections. WMATA's network perfectly complements the region's growing bike network and vice versa. This month, we had the opportunity to meet with WMATA staff to review the new 8000 series rail car design. We deeply appreciated that engagement and appreciate even more the thoughtful design and accessibility improvements staff developed and presented that notably improve on the 7000 series. We enthusiastically support the proposed open gangway walkthrough design that, along with more bench seating, will help reduce crowding and allow more options to reposition once on the train. And we especially appreciate the inclusion of flexible spaces designated for bicycles, strollers, and luggage. Designated space for those of us with bulkier items, combined with a more open layout, results in better accommodation and a smoother transit experience for all of WMATA's diverse ridership. Thank you for the opportunity to share today, and we look forward to working with WMATA towards a multimodal future. Okay, and we have one in-person speaker today, Mr. Rico, D Mr. Rico Dancy. Good morning, Rico. Good morning. So thank you for the trip for New York I went to. I'm an AAC member. Um, any other cities across the country have a monthly pass for people with a disability. Cleveland have a monthly pass for disability. Baltimore City have it. But we don't have nothing like that. If people who get Social Security, SSI, after they pay the bills and want to get the mother pass, it's nothing for us. We want to be treated as fair like any other city have monthly pass for citizens with a disability, deaf, blind, whatever. We need to be treated with fair and honest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dancy. Is that it, um, John? Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. Uh, and as a reminder, there are several ways to provide comments uh, to the board um, at its meetings. First, uh, you know, we have our monthly meeting. You can register before the start of the meeting. We have audio comments. You can call us at 202-962-1901 to record your comment. Uh, there's also an opportunity for video, as you saw with Mr. O'Brien. Uh, you can shoot a video with your mobile phone and email it to speak at wamata.com. Uh, but you must include your name and jurisdiction uh, of your residence, uh, and all comments must be under two minutes. Now we'll hear from the Accessibility Advisory Committee, Mr. Sheehan, and Mr. Sheehan's joining us via Teams this morning. Thank you very much. Hopefully you can all hear me. We can, Pat. Um, Good morning. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, my other bosses have taken over a little bit of my time this morning. Well, that's quite all right. But it's good to have Teams be able to talk. First, I'd like to say a very heartfelt thanks. I said that you over here with Pat, start again. Pat, could you start again uh, or get a little closer to your uh, computer or the phone? Yeah. Yep. Is this better? That's a little better, yep. Okay. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, I wanted to express the heartfelt thanks from the committee. For um, work that you did on the budget and keeping your promises like you said you would on the 14th, getting the fixed fare for Metro. Really, really appreciate that. You worked on that for 10 years. I really appreciate the, the, the November committee for that fixed fare. Uh, on the 1st of May, we've invited uh, members of the board. Uh, to the AAC meeting for maybe the first 15 minutes of the meeting. So the members of the AAC could thank so that would be 5.30 on the of And we do appreciate it and the disability community also appreciate it. We 
have met with um, Lynn Bowersant and Brian Dwyer uh, several times in the month of April um, <clears throat> to talk about gangway cars. Uh, we had some uh, considerations and some issues that we were concerned about, particularly, particularly dealing with interoperability uh, between different sets of cars as far as the, the gangway series is concerned, configuration of seating, um, and uh, how that would work, uh, areas of safety that might be the fire safety, <clears throat> the availability of expansions and full seniors like myself, let's say, to get up and down from the seats, uh, and and basically uh, how the cars would be constructed. When we sent six people, to, we had six people from AAC travel to New York. What we learned was that uh, they really like, as the last uh, speaker talked about, the ability to have bicycles, strollers, wheelchairs, um, luggage, let's say, cars easily and available. Uh, the seating configuration was very much to the liking of what individuals have seen and appreciate. Uh, the fire safety and safety issues that we asked about have been addressed. I understand that interoperability be addressed also <clears throat> and make sure that that is secured. So all in general, I think uh, I appreciate the efforts of the folks that um, came to New York. Really appreciate uh, Brian Dwyer and Lynn Barsox, who have spent a lot of time in front of us to get the information that they needed. Uh, they have been great in the information we have gotten back concerning open gaming cars has been beneficial for both our disabled community also hopefully input so we will continue those discussions that um, the other a couple other things that we have been involved with uh, understand that the waymaps internal gps program is starting up in may and june time frame you'll have members of the aac involved in that working from uh, point A to point B, that's the system on a soft rollout. I also think that uh, members of the disability community, blindness community in the DC area, Virginia, DC, and Maryland are, are very interested in this, so they will also be in think we'll get some good feedback on that. Then lastly, uh, I would say that the Bus islands, as they are being called now, not floating bus stops anymore. Uh, we had a demonstration on the project. I know that WMATA is looking at bus islands, Washington, D.C. area. Montgomery County had uh, about 20 participants out there to test what is being proposed regionally and uh, configuration of what we saw was very good. We appreciated the work. That and Montgomery County. It was good to have WMATA out there. Uh, members of the AEC were also out there. The Access Board was out there, and so was uh, some uh, other stakeholders. So we think we're going to make some good progress with respect to getting uh, bus islands, as we're calling it now, a good configuration. And then I heard later on that the Federal Highway Administration also standard configurations out these bus islands nationwide and <clears throat> Montgomery County will be asked I think, to participate on that. I think that uh, a lot of the work that they're doing in this area and what side Montgomery County is to participate too. So it's nice to be leading the pack on something that they can have something to show. A good, uh, I think we had a good month. I'm very pleased uh, to report all of this. Thank you very much for your support. Are there any questions for me? Okay. Thank you, Pat. Any questions for Mr. Sheehan? So, Pat, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. How good of a guide was Lynn? Uh, very good. Oh, she very good? Great. Okay, just very yeah. good? Oh, she was excellent. <laughs> uh, excellent. Everyone was very, very pleased <laughs> with the trip and uh, good experience and the feedback that uh, nothing like being able to walk on the trains and get the I like what I've seen. I'm 
show the rack had favorable uh, things to see. Ben has been great. Uh, she's really addressed all the questions, given us plenty of time. A lot of good feedback. All right. Okay. Thank really you, Pat. Excellent team. Thank great. you. Thank you so much. Thanks for all your committee's work. Uh, next, uh, I'll call on Mr. Mike Leibowitz, the Writers Advisor Council's newly elected chair, to provide his report. Welcome, Mr. Leibowitz. If you could just. Good morning. And good morning. Would you like to say a little bit about yourself so we get to know you a little better? Hi, good morning. I'm Mike Leibowitz. I'm uh, honored to be the new uh, RAC chair. And I. Uh, I'm a Silver Line writer. I write every day from Wheelie Reston to uh, downtown DC. I'm a government lawyer and a lieutenant colonel in the Army Reserves. And I've been taking the Metro for well over 10 years at this point by now. Um, I also would like to uh, acknowledge Brian Meyer, who's sitting back here. He actually came here uh, you know, to kind of do the handoff for the RAC. Um, his leadership of the RAC was amazing. It's something that I hope to emulate just the way um, his pragmatism and his, uh, his attitude and his devotion to um, being an advocate for the writers is something that um, I really admire. And uh, I don't mind having him stand up just to acknowledge him. I would love to do that. It was really just to embarrass him more than anything else by making him have stand up. <laughs> so um, on that note, we did have a very busy, uh, the rack had a very busy um, April. Uh, we. Uh, we had, um, we had some good meetings uh, where the RAC asked some very poignant and tough questions uh, regarding the, the gangways for the new 8,000 series trains, as well as for the uh, courtesy stops initiative. Uh, for the gangways, the RAC as a whole um, really, uh, really liked the idea. And I think after, the, after everybody went to New York, I think they were more, more, even more bullish about it. We had some questions, uh, just various things about how security things, how more tactical tangible things would work. Um, same thing with the courtesy stops. So we had some very tough questions, mainly because we wanted to avoid unintended consequences that might come out of that to make sure that um, the uh, kind of everything was thought through and, and the answers were all very good or to the extent there were no response. They didn't have any answers. They said they would get back. So I thought that was an excellent discussion. And um, the one thing, another thing I wanted to talk about today was a new thing. Uh, April was the first month of that the RAC has completed its first annual report. And uh, according to the, a reading of the RAC bylaws, it's within the first sentence of the mission statement. And uh, the fundamental um, goal or activity of the RAC is to seek writer input and uh, actively seek writer input and gauge what was of writer concerns and then what potential proposed potential solutions. So my view and this is uh, carrying on from the leadership of Brian, is to be, kind of be the unfiltered voice of the writers so we can kind of compile what their information is, what's going on, and bring that to the board's attention, along with proposed solutions to the extent we have some of that. Um, I want to hit a few high points of the, uh, of the re review, or the annual report, if you uh, don't mind. And uh, so the big finding that we had. And again, the methodology was uh, RAC members went out during commutes and rides through uh, for over a course of several months uh, recently and just asked riders essentially three questions or a couple questions. So what are your top three concerns uh, regarding a transit? This is across the transit zone, buses, trains, metro access. And what are any potential or proposed solutions you might have uh, to address your concerns? So the RAC compiled those into our report, put them in the report, and then um, that's, I hope that uh, this board take, you know, reviews some of that and uh, takes into account because this is the unvarnished view of what the riders out there every day are thinking and saying is, um, that's based on our methodology. And the big thing is that riders said that they, across the board, riders thought that things are noticeably improved over previous years. Uh, riders that pay attention more to the inner workings of WMATA, specifically cited the general manager, Mr. Clark. Um, I agree with that, thinking that, saying that things are looking better and looking good. However, the caveat is the riders at the same conversation said 
they're waiting for the system to fall apart. So <laughs> it's a uh, so um, good luck, sir. <laughs> But um, so but the main thing was that the uh, the biggest so kind of calculating statistics of the, over the hundred people that we spoke to, sixty percent of the riders um, stated that their, one of their top three concerns was the long term health of the system and consistency of operations, and that was a, a big jump of that. Um, and then there is another, some of them more surprising. I'll, I'll just tick them off really quick. Uh, fare evasion was thirty nine percent, which I think is probably not surprising to you at this point. Um, the one that surprised us was the smoke, marijuana, invasive customer behavior on trains, buses, and stations. 27% of the people we spoke to said this was among their top concerns. Um, bus frequency and crowding was 26%. General safety was 24%. Another interesting one was the parking lots and costs, um, this particularly in the outlying in the suburb, um, 14%. And then 12% actually had issues with uh, Metro card reader issues. So the... Long-term health one, I think, is, is the big one for you because all the other ones the writers describe is almost like death by a thousand cuts where you might look at the smoking one as kind of a seemingly minor issue or parking lot cuts is seemingly, whatever you look at it, but then the writers, what they express to the rack is that it compounds and it compounds on each other. So, and I want to give you a really quick anecdote. I'll be brief, and usually I won't talk this much um, just because we wrote a report, we feel like we need to talk about it. Um, so this, so, after the re we wrote the report, finalized it, the RAC approved it. There is an anecdote from Monday where I had an impromptu uh, writer kind of outreach pro because I saw it and other writers saw this. And it kind of encapsulated a lot of what we incorporated in the report. And the big takeaway is what writers said after the fact. So a bunch of writers got on at various stages on the Silver Line from Ashburn on down to about through Tyson's to, um, to about East Falls Church. Many of them parked in the parking lots, they had to find a parking spot, they paid for the parking spot, they, you know, they walked to the train, they waited about 12 minutes to get on the train. They got on the train and at some point during the ride, a rider uh, got on the train, sat in one of the priority seatings, and uh, rolled a joint, started smoking it, very blatantly just blowing it on people around, it was very, and then he pulled out a bag of weed, pulled out other little bags of pl plastic bags and started putting um, marijuana into different bags, which is clear intent to distribute at some point after he got off the train, all while he was just smoking the, uh, his marijuana in them. So after the fact, a number of riders got off in the downtown core, and we started talking because it was very obvious that people in the train were kind of, I don't know if they were impressed by, uh, by the, the brazenness of this, but we got to talking, and I said, hey, you know, we put together this report, a member of the RAC, can I get your thoughts about this? And then did they have thoughts, and they had passion about it? And so the reason why this is a big deal is because, again, it's the death by a thousand cuts. They said, well, you know, all of them brought up, paid for parking. We had to find parking. Took 12 minutes to wait for a train, got on the train. And then this, this uh, ingesting this. And a lot of them, I don't know what he was smoking, to be honest, but a lot of people, including myself, had sore throats, which we've all or, um, experienced kind of these smoking incidents on the trains. But that one was particularly rough, and I don't know why. So... The, th the reason I bring this anecdote up is because it highlights a lot of what the writers were concerned with and what they said. Uh, our report, we mentioned this, and the writers on Monday mentioned the exact same thing the report said, is that they were thinking this is why they want to find alternatives to Metro. And that's a big deal. And I think that's something that I wanted to bring to your attention because I think that's backwards. It seems like Metro should be the alternative to driving, the alternative to... Um, you know, I mean, it's, if you want to bring people back to the office, that kind of thing. But these riders across the board said they want to limit their amount of time on Metro. And it's because they're citing to all of these different things as compounding on them. And that's an issue. And it goes right back to the top concern that 60% of the people that we spoke to was, is the long-term health. Because what it creates is, again, and again, this is all based on our discussions with riders, is it's almost rider apathy. Riders just kind of like, ah. Metro can take it or leave it. It's not, you know, they rely on it or they can try to get around relying on it. And the apathy is huge because it, if, if riders are apathetic, then they're going to be less likely to pressure their elected representatives for funding. Um, they're going to be more likely to look at alternatives, whether it's more focused on work from home or any other things that are other than taking the train every day. So that's kind of the takeaway 
from this top concern that the writers had had. And um, subject to any questions, that's all I have for you. Thank you, Mr. Leibowitz. Um, but you did start out positively. So um, <laughs> recognizing that Metro is uh, improving and uh, the, they have faith in the, 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 you know, the new general manager. Well, I think so, I, there is a, I thought I'd like to say one yeah, thing, isn't, yeah. sir, is that we did have a section in the report on positives. And I think yeah. the fact that writers still do care, and they, they, they have told us they want the system to succeed. They want it to grow. Their concerns are, again, with the financial um, situation, this compounding issues of personal safety and that kind of stuff, all that compounding. But they want it to succeed. And that's, that's a big, I think that's a big point yeah, that I should have. Yeah, that is a really important point. Mr. Letourneau. Yeah, I get your point. I, I completely understand it. I'm just curious, just just for pure, did any of those riders text MTPD at any point during that like 40 minutes? Just curious. So that's actually one of our recommendations in our report addresses that exact issue because I thought about doing that. Yeah. The only time I think in recent times that I've personally texted MTP was um, was there was a uh, incident where an individual was smoking cigarettes and deliberately walking down the car, blowing in people's faces. In this instance, I think people are so flabbergasted. But one person actually did mention that he wanted to text um, the transit police. And he went on the, on the website, you know, kind of fiddling around on his phone. And I guess the, I know the text number is there, but it's not easy. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm asking because maybe we need to do a better job yeah. making that really visible. It's, it's in the in my it's, general manager. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, right. So just to remind everyone right now, you can text MTPD at 696. Eight seven three. Take your phone out. You take your phone out. It is right already now. in my phone. Program. You can just save it in your phone. I have it under here as Metro Text Tips six nine six eight. Everyone, take out your phone right now. Six nine six eight seven three. Save it in your phone. Okay. So in that incident, <laughs> people did not. Don't even need a whole. It's not even a whole number. Just put in six nine six. 873. I don't know how phones work, but like amazing, it, it will work. This I've used, I use it a lot. Is it really works? Okay. Everyone put All it right. in your phone right now. Okay. For the general ridership, I would say that I think, and we, if, I'd, I'd urge you to look at our report where we talk about. We need the report. It sh should have been sent to you, but you can. Yeah. It was attached to the RAC report. So we do have some, um, I'm not going to get into every single thing in there, but there are, there are solutions and reasons why we post things as we do. Okay, great. But that's an excellent question. All right. Any other comments or questions from Mr. Leibowitz? All right. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Take care. Uh, Mr. Leibowitz stole a little bit of our thunder. Uh, Brian, would you uh, please stand or come up front? Uh, so we'd like to have a little recognition of Brian here uh, on behalf of the board. Brian was appointed to the RAC in January uh, 2021, representing Virginia. He was selected as RAC's Virginia vice chair uh, in shortly after his appointment and then served as the de facto chair when the current chair uh, relocated. Uh, the board has appreciated his steady and collaborative leadership, his willingness to consider and report on all viewpoints as part of the RAC's deliberations. I can also say as board chair that I've appreciated the energy and that Brian has put into only immersing himself in all things Metro, including closely following the board's meetings and agendas, but also learning about how this board works so he and the RAC can provide relevant and focused recommendations. We're, we, uh, we're encouraged that Brian will remain on the RAC, uh, which is good news as a member, and we look forward to continuing to work uh, with the new leadership team uh, to ensure Ryder's input remains a central part of the board's decision making. There are a lot of big decisions coming up uh, where the board, we will, where we will definitely need the RAC's input, better bus, the fiscal year budget uh, slash financial cliff, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you, Brian, uh, for all you have done. And I know we've, you took over at a time of a lot of transition, a lot of new board, uh, RAC members. Uh, appreciate uh, also Brian Helfer, who's our alternate uh, federal member working and engaging with the group uh, and with staff members. And, and John, who uh, chairs the RAC, uh, but, uh, or uh, staffs the RAC, sorry. Um, uh, but would you like to say anything? Yeah, of course. Perfect. 
Well, thank you so much, uh, Chairman Smedberg and everyone else on the board. It's been a pleasure working with you. Uh, not only do I just appreciate the recognition, but more importantly, I am very grateful and thankful that you all have created an environment of transparency and collaboration. So our advisory councils, whether it be AAC or RAC, or even just the public in general, can really engage with our staff and our board about what they care about and what needs to be done to make this metro system uh, better and better every single day. And so thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And again, uh, John, Jose, without them. And I'm looking forward to sticking onto the rack and uh, keep on doing the good work. So thank you so much. And Brian, before you go, we have a small token of appreciation for you. Again, Brian, thank you for your leadership during that time of transition. Um, and one last thing, in addition uh, to April being Autism Acceptance Month, as was noted earlier, it's also National Arab American Heritage Month. Americans of Arab, Arab heritage have in, advanced the nation's achievements in diplomacy, science, technology, as well as art and culture. Arab Americans have also been on the forefront of the fight for civil rights. We mark National Arab American Heritage Month by celebrating the rich culture and heritage of Arab, Arab Americans and honoring the contributions to this country. And finally, I would also like to note that there will be only one board day during the month of May. That'll be May 11th. We will address all committee and board business that day. Again, there'll be no board activities on May 25th, the Thursday before Memorial Day weekend. That concludes my report. Now I'll turn it over to the general manager, Mr. Clark. Thank you, Chair. I know everyone will be upset that we don't have a board meeting a couple days before Memorial Day weekend. So we will have a productive one in, in, in mid-May. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the board today on the general manager report. Uh, and I appreciate uh, the conversation we had with the uh, representatives from AAC and the RAC. And I think it speaks to the, the great work that you know, we're really trying to get both groups engaged. We want to hear their feedback. We want to deliver a better system for them. And I'm going to take that challenge that uh, you know, things are not going to fall apart. So we're going to keep on working forward. Uh, and we're going to stay optimistic as a, as a team. Uh, I'm going to start off with, uh, oh, I don't know where the slide, there we go, perfect, thank you. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Chair, uh, uh, this, this month, Autism Acceptance Month. And I just wanted to highlight the, the not only the, 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 you know, thank the board for the recognition uh, that that you did for our employees uh, in, in that acknowledgement, but the event that we, we had out at Springfield last week. It's just a fantastic event. This is with the uh, Autism Transit Project uh, going on with uh, New York City Transit, New Jersey Transit, uh, Atlanta, MARTA, uh, BART, and, and now, now we are part of it. And it was just a fantastic event. We had so many uh, individuals from our community that are are uh, experiencing or have family members with, uh, that are, are on the spectrum with autism and that are just amazing transit enthusiasts. So the joy that this event brought, uh, I'll tell you, it was one of the best of days that I've had the opportunity to be the general manager. Um, and I think it meant a lot uh, to members of the community and internally that we did this. So I think it's another example of what we need to continue to do, which is highlighting this theme of your metro. It's a community system. And there is a deeper theme that we bring to this region that is just the pure service um, and you know, leaning into that being a great community partner. So I really appreciate uh, all the people that attended. And we look forward to doing it again next year um, and uh, you know, onward and even bigger, bigger next year. Uh, and I think we might have some shirts li left over if, if you're looking for a transit enthusiast shirt. We can make sure you have one. Uh, what's also amazing is April is almost over, which is just hard to believe. Uh, <laughs> but it was been a busy month here at Metro. So I want to highlight a few things on the next slide that we've been working on in, in April, kind of almost like a recap. So uh, the chief will be up here in a second with a little update. But uh, we just had our most recent uh, MTPD uh, class graduation, which we had 18 new officers welcome to the Metro family. And I really appreciate these officers joining. It is, a, it is a very big challenge uh, right now in our country to recruit and retain police officers. Uh, it's a challenging environment to be a police officer in 2023. 
uh, and these individuals decided to be part of this organization. So we thank them for being part of it, and I appreciate the ongoing leadership of Chief Anzala. We are very lucky to have the chief. He has an enormous amount of experience, and he brings just, just great leadership. He understands the concept of community policing, and there's probably no more community policing than, than anywhere in America than transit policing. It's engaging directly. Um, and you know, he emphasizes you know, getting out and giving direction to someone is actually the best form of kind of policing versus having to worry about the actual problem. So I appreciate all the work the Chief's doing, and I welcome our, our, our new officers to the department. I thank the board again for passing budget. We forget that we actually passed the budget this month, how, how quickly that uh, already went by. Uh, but you know, but almost a $5 billion budget, and I'm really happy that we're, we're working right away now as staff to, to implement, whether it's signage changes, our new fare programs, our Metro Access $4 cap, our low income fare, fare program. We're moving through all of those things right now, and I just want to let the board know we'll continue to update you if, if we see any implementation issues, but um, so far, so good. We're, we're off to the races. The escalator picture on the bottom right is something I want to highlight. Uh, that's the new uh, escalators at Rockville Station, but I think it's important. You know, we, we kind of forget how important escalators sometimes are to the system. They're incredibly important. Uh, 2022, we replaced 26 escalators, but what's really great is Already in 2023, we replaced 12 escalators. So these are very pricey, very complicated systems that unfortunately do take some time to get done. But when they are done, the reliability and safety is so high. So I want to you know, just thank, thank the board uh, for the CIP investment and all of our regional partners, because this is the value of the dedicated funding. We are actually making the system not only state of repair, we're modernizing it to have a much better system for everyone. Um, so it's these little things that go a long way to making the whole experience. We uh, moved into our next, uh, what we hope will be about the final phase of our return to service plan on our 7Ks, and I we'll want thank the WMSC, our partners on that. We're now measuring across all of our trains at a 15-day interval, and so I know Brian and the team are looking forward to getting, uh, uh, using that 15-day period to continue to analyze data with the safety team, but also uh, to try to try to run, run even more trains in the fleet, and we expect next week to probably announce uh, some more service. We announced this week, uh, or this month as well, our Clear Lanes program with DDOT. So we're off to the races on that as well. And we look forward to getting people out of our bus lanes so we can move the bus system more, more efficiently. Uh, we're carrying a lot of people every day on the bus system, and it's actually continuing to grow. And, and I think another good example of investing in our bus system. I want to let the, you know, the board know, we obviously put out our summer construction schedules, more information publicly on that if anyone needs it. Uh, we started our, our ATO testing on the red line. So I think we've had three nights of testing. Um, you know, the, go the concept of testing is to find issues, right? That's what testing. So um, the, the team is finding little nuance issues here and there. Uh, that's what the process is. The WMSC has been out with, with the team, and we're going to keep just working this. The idea is to everyday test, try, try, try to find another issue, work through it, and continue to work to confidence and our safety certification on ATO. So we'll keep uh, the board and the public updated as we advance on that, but transparency, I want to let everybody know when we're moving forward on that. We, knock, we talked about the, the New York trip. Um, it was really great that so many people were willing to, the next slide please, were willing to go up uh, with, with the team to New York, and I want, Lynn, Lynn took the, the lead on this, but a, a, other, a lot of other members were involved as well. Uh, to take staff up and look at what New York's doing with their open gangway and different seating design, I think it was really important. Uh, I know the AAC put a recommendation years ago to move towards this kind of train design. It is certainly much safer, uh, but to hear uh, comments from WABA and the RAC, kind of thinking that that's where everyone wants to go as well. So, uh, you know, we, we still have a little bit more work to do, but clearly we want to provide a, a rail system that is better for everyone and, and, and advance world-class kind of not only technology, but best practices, which, which this is. Um, earlier this month, we announced Potomac Yard. So I hope everyone has it on their calendar, May 19th. We're gonna be open to Potomac Yard Station. Uh, it's been, it's, it, it's been uh, uh, multiple years thinking about to get this thing open, and I'm really excited. Uh, it coincides greatly with a new service plan uh, that's going to run more yellow line service as well. So really excited to get that station open. I know our partners in Alexandria are as well. We kicked off our Better Bus uh, Network redesign, which, you know, thank the board for your interest and participation. We have 50 events in 50 days. A whole bunch of them have already happened. Really encourage the community to give us feedback. I'll tell you, the event we had last Friday was packed. And every place we are, whether the, the, the events internally, to get bus operator or staff feedback to the public, 
people are very excited about our bus network redesign. And everyone, as you could imagine, has an opinion on the bus network. Uh, and everyone almost universally says they want the same thing. Fast, frequent, safe, reliable service. I mean, it's not probably rocket science. That's what makes a great transit system. But speed and reliability specifically are what people want in a, in a bus system. And that's what the network's supposed to do. So we'll, we'll continue to advance that. And then the last piece on this slide I really want to highlight, and I got to tell you, the autism event was amazing. This might be number two, is uh, this week we had our Earth Day celebration. And I want to thank Laurent and uh, a whole bunch of other members of our team that did our transit and uh, art and transit program. And what we did is we, as you know, asked students around the region to tell us what they think Earth Day means and how transit you know, is, is valuable for sustainability. And we had several hundred uh, submissions, these 15 uh, young students, and I appreciate Board Member Lowe joined for the, for the, pres uh, for the presenting certificates for, for all of the students. And we had all their buses outside. So you're going to see a bus uh, in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia going around with student art talking about Earth Day and sustainability and what it means to them. We had almost 100 people here, parents. We had grandparents. It was, an, again, another great example of community and bringing joy uh, and us thinking about how Metro really means a lot to people. So uh, we'll do that again next year. But I think it was a great, great launch of, of what we could do. Uh, the last picture there is our sustainability awards, and I just want to reiterate my thanks to the staff. That's an annual event that we recognize sustainability and equity awards internally and people advancing great programs here at Metro, whether it's zero emission vehicles to our low income fare program, those types of things. Our staff is working very hard every day, and it's great to see them getting recognized for their good work. Uh, the last piece I do want to highlight is a little bit on the visibility ambassadors public safety piece. So uh, we are working incredibly hard on this topic. This is a topic we probably talk about every single board meeting. I certainly, uh, I was at a Fort Totten station yesterday uh, talking to people on the train about it. Uh, I will tell you again, we have police officers everywhere in this system. Everywhere that we can, we have police officers. I saw just yesterday on the train trip, I saw four different officers. So uh, they're doing car checks where they're walking on the train, looking back and forth, getting off a train, sometimes they're riding two stops and getting off and riding the other way. Uh, we have special police officers that we hired and put them at a whole bunch of stations. Our partners at MPD and a bunch of other regional partners have, uh, have are staffing extra details for us as well. Uh, but we also got to be honest, we're never going to have a police officer everywhere. And as much as that story bothers me of someone smoking, I think most people realize we, there's only so much we can do. So additive to the police officers are things like ambassadors. So currently, uh, I believe it is, we have 25 ambassadors. I could see us definitely uh, uh, adding to, to this. This is basically a customer service type of role that is more eyes and ears out on the system, can tell you how to get around, how to help you with a mobile fare. A couple of yesterday, I saw, I actually ran into an ambassador on a train. She's talking about how she's helping people use mobile wallet to get off the smart trip, as an example. She's at a map helping someone where they could do trip planning, uh, where to go. Uh, we want to bring that customer-oriented approach uh, to Metro. So it's both you know, visibility, safety, security, but also customer-centric. Uh, to the question about uh, M MTPD, we are going to be launching a very significant visibility campaign about texting uh, my MTPB. So that's a good example of, 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 of what's up on a digital sign right now. But all of our buses, all of our trains are all getting either stickers or labels or signage put on every single one. Uh, we want to encourage everyone to use that. So our role is to make it way more known how to respond if you see something. And our job is to be very fast on that response. So uh, I will tell you that we have this integrated video approach now on our, on our vehicles and at our stations. Uh, and our responses are getting faster. They're getting more knowledgeable so we can deal with things. So we, we have to continue to push this idea of please, please, please let us know when you see something because we can't be everywhere and we kind of respond really well. Um, last two things I kind of want to, to mention are, and uh, the first one, I know she's going to be in horribly embarrassed when I do this, but, you know, the, the, the joy of having a microphone. Um, so I want to recognize uh, Christy Swink Benson, uh, so who is... Uh, there's probably no one that has taken more text messages from me in the last nine months. And you know, whether it's six in the morning or ten o'clock at night, uh, Christy makes makes it like I don't like I have no energy. That's how uh, engaged and just committed to this organization she is. Kiss, Christy is our senior vice president of communications and um, marketing, and uh, handles 
any and all things in those categories. But uh, there was a, a publication that just came out called Women We Admire in the DC area, and it recognized the top 50 women leaders in DC. And these are the heavyweight leaders in the DMV. And Christy came in number 12. Now, of course, she's number one to us. You know, and we'll, do, and we'll make sure that they understand that she's really number one. But I think that's a pretty amazing recognition in the, in, you know, the capital of America. We, we're, our senior vice president of marketing communications is listed as one of the most influential women leaders in, in the region. So Christy, thank you for what you do every day. I really appreciate it. <laughs> and Mr. Chair, since uh, it's a meeting, we, uh, as you know, on the realignment, we have we have some different positions and we're putting together. So a few people have started and I just wanted them to stand so we could recognize them. So the first, I'm gonna have uh, Sarah Mayer stand up. So Sarah is our first ever at Metro Chief Experience and Engagement Officer. And Sarah comes, comes to us uh, via New York City Transit where she was the cust uh, Chief Customer Officer. So Sarah actually has probably more passion for customers than I do as well. So um, on a train ride yesterday, Sarah probably helped 12 customers just do fares and directions, and she just moved to DC. So um, again, this whole lens of we are every day focused on the customer, all in on the customer every day, and that's what she helped do in New York City, which did a lot of transformation up there. So we really appreciate uh, Sarah joining the team. Uh, Roy Aguilera is, is with us as well. So Roy is our Senior Vice President of the Metro Integrated Command and Control Center, our new MIC that we're building in Eisenhower. So he's gonna have all of, for the first time ever at Metro, we're combining all of our individual control centers and we're gonna actually have this place organized. Everyone talking together, everyone working together. And Roy, uh, came. so some of you may recognize Roy actually was part of the peer review for the ATO process and, and Roy ran at San Francisco BART all of the control center and training there. So probably 30 years in the business, knows the stuff inside and out. And after the peer review, he actually said, hey, I know you're looking for that. Maybe, you know, he's like, I really like Metro. I, maybe I'm interested. Hey, Roy uh, joining, I think it's gonna be a, a big help as we move to ATO and this integrated control center. And then last, I see Jeff, uh, Jeff uh, Hyatt. Uh, Jeff is our new senior vice president of bus transformation. And so equivalent to Lynn Bowersock's role, so Lynn will be on the rail side, Jeff on the bus side, trying to make sure programmatically we have all of our things stitched together. Uh, Jeff has an extensive experience in the business. Uh, most of his career was at APTA. He ran all of the bus standards and the bus, uh, bus programs at APTA. Uh, he also ran all the peer reviews and uh, safety audit program as well. And then actually for a period of time, Jeff was actually at Cap Metro with the same role as well. So Jeff kind of knows literally every human being in the bus business. So. Uh, happy that uh, he has joined the team as well. So those are the new additions to the team. Uh, and, uh, you know, any questions, Chair, I'm happy to take them. Any questions or comments for Mr. Clark? Great, you're robbing these peer reviews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, amazing. We are creating opportunities. <laughs> All right. And as Randy said, a very busy, productive month, so, which is great. Uh, next, the report by the Finance and Capital Committee, Mr. Letourneau. I think we Thank have you. two we have items. Two, to two items referred to the board from the April 14th Finance and Capital Committee meeting. Item A is approval of Clear Lanes Reimbursable Project. Staff sought approval to execute a reimbursable project agreement with the district to advance the Clear Lanes project that we talked about at our last meeting, an automated uh, camera enforcement program. Mr. Chairman, I move approval. Mr. Letourneau has put a motion on the table. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Deputy Mayor. Ms. Ellison, please call the roll. Or administer the vote. Chair Smedberg? Aye. Vice Chair Babers? Aye. Vice Chair Drummer? Aye. Ms. Klein? Aye. Mr. Letourneau? Aye. Ms. Lowe? Aye. Ms. McAndrew? Aye. Ms. Martin Proctor? Aye. Mr. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Letourneau. Next item. And the second item is authorization to conduct compact public hearings and issue joint development solicitations. Staff sought authorization to hold compact public hearings for changes to transit facilities at six stations, Brooklyn, Capitol Heights, Congress Heights, Deanwood, Forest Glen, and North Bethesda, and issue joint development solicitations for seven stations, Brooklyn, Capitol Heights, Congress Heights, Deanwood, Eisenhower Avenue, Mill Road, Fort Totten, and North Bethesda. Mr. Chairman, I move approval. There's a motion on the table by Mr. Letourneau. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Drummer. Any discussion? 
Hearing none, Ms. Uh, Ellison, please administer the vote. Chair Smedberg? Aye. Vice Chair Babers? Aye. Vice Chair Drummer? Aye. Ms. Klein? Aye. Mr. Letourneau? Aye. Dr. Lowe? Aye. Mr. McAndrew? Aye. Ms. Martin Proctor? Aye. Mr. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Letourneau. Now we move on to the consent items. We have four consent items for board approval today. I'd like to move approval of the following items. First, parking fee waiver during summer shutdown, approval of a resolution to waive parking fees, both rider and non-rider at Vienna, Dunloring, West Falls Church, East Falls Church, Greenbelt, College Park, Hyattsville Crossing, West Hyattsville during the summer's orange and green line improvement projects. Second, WMATA debt policy, uh, management policy. Staff seeks approval of WMATA's debt management policy, which increases the capacity of Metro's line of credit to $500 million and caps interest rates at the secured overnight financing rate plus 7%. Third, zero admission bus goal update, approval of a resolution to update Metro's zero admission bus goals, reflecting an acceleration of the transition by three years, including transition to 100% zero admission buses, bus purchases by 2027, and transitioning to 100% zero admission fleet by 2042. And last, indemnification of Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation, Staff seeks board approval to indemnify the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation for current and future congestion mitigation and air quality grants, local match funding agreements in, in substantially the same form as the proposed resolution. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Dr. Lowe. Any final discussion? No discussion? Uh, yeah. Any voice vote? All in yeah. favor. All in favor? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next, we move on to the uh, jurisdictions, uh, jurisdictional reports. Uh, NVTC. Uh, Mr. Letourneau, I don't. I don't have anything. So. Yeah. District of Columbia. I don't have anything. Okay, we don't have anything. Okay. <laughs> WSTC, Mr. Drummer. We don't have anything. Okay. And federal government, Ms. Oh, let me check with Ms. Martin Proctor online. Hi. Good morning. No, I don't have anything. Thank you, Director Klein. Uh, with no further business to come before the board, we will stand adjourned. And now I'll turn the floor over to the Safety and Operations Committee Chair, Mr. Drummer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smedberg. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Safety and Operations Committee. Our first order of business, of course, is to approve the agenda. Are there any objections by members of the committee? Hearing none, uh, the agenda is approved. Now to approval of our minutes uh, from our April 14th meeting. Are there any objections? Hearing none, uh, the minutes are approved as presented. Uh, this morning we have one information uh, item on the agenda. Members of our team will provide an update on Metro's public safety initiatives. Uh, this builds on a presentation we received in January and will also include uh, the status and initial impact of our Fairgate retrofit program. So, Chief Gonzalo. yeah, are they? Yes. I know Chief Gonzalo is here. Yeah. Mr. Dwyer, uh, Chief Gonzalo, and Mr. Webster, I think, are coming forward. So as stated, I'll turn the floor over to Mr. Dwyer and Chief Anzalo. Chair, awfully sorry to be delayed there. No problem. Pardon me. Good day, Mr. Chairman and Madam Vice Chairwoman. I am joined by Chief Anzalo. The purpose of our presentation today is to apprise you and other members of the board of re recent efforts within the Operations Directorate to continue to enhance security for our customers and employees throughout the system, while ensuring that we expand our efforts in assisting those among us in need of support services and continuing our excellent community service programs. 
Next slide, please. Chief Gonzalo and I have been before the Operations and Safety Committee a number of times in the last six months discussing a variety of public safety initiatives. Though the information we discuss may change, the themes do not. Although our primary mission is transit, the authority is clearly invested in the DMV community. As with many other communities across the country and the world, we encounter an unprecedented amount of individuals in need of mental health assistance. Our dedicated MTB, MTPD and operations staff take seriously their charge in attempting to get these individuals the help they need. We are doing all we can at the general manager's prompting to implement a video-centric culture at this authority. Past presentations have discussed ongoing and planned augmentations to facility and vehicle cameras. Today, Chief will discuss our Body One camera program. And finally, we'll discuss the significant expansion of the number of offices, police officials, and special police we have out on the system writ large on a daily basis. A 70% increase in law enforcement and security on the system since September of last year is pretty incredible. And it's been made possible by the general manager's support and direct direction, chief and the command staff's leadership, and the support of fellow departments like DC Police, MY, and Greenbelt, just as examples, as well as our special police contractor. Next slide, please, Jose. One of the general manager's first initiatives was to request that we create a crisis intervention specialist position within MTPD. It's really an industry best practice and used by a number of other large agencies. This position is focused on reacting to reports of or finding inv individuals on our system who are in need of mental health services. Based on a previous request from the board, we have attempted to provide some metrics supporting the classification's effectiveness. You'll see those on the slide, I hope. As of March, they have responded to or generated over 120 calls for assistance. This assistance ranges from shelter for the unhoused, drug and alcohol intervention services, to getting mental health assistance. 60% of the individuals encountered have received follow-up services. The team is deployed throughout the system on a daily basis, rotating hours and shifts to ensure that we are encountering as many individuals in need of service, service as possible. We have been thrilled with the success of this program, and I believe it is one of the most impactful steps that we have undertaken to represent Metro as a progressive public agency. We had indicated previously that we wanted to see results from the current team before looking to augment it. Based on their solid work performance, we are adding six new members. Interviews are underway, and we'll hope to have the team trained and deployed in the next couple of months. Chief, I'll turn it to you. All right, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, as far as building uh, community through our compassion outreach, uh, our youth programs are still full in effect. I think some of the board members have attained, attended our youth advisory council meetings. Uh, we've grown the program from about 15 participants uh, to a little bit over 70. So we're working primarily with youth that, one, that want to come to the programs, but also ones that we encounter when we work with the schools to try to get those kids into some of these uh, programs that we're sponsoring. Uh, we're still participating in DC Safe Passages, and we've started a restorative justice partnership with the DC Attorney General's Office, which we hope will also help us uh, our outreach efforts, uh, particularly with the kids that we encounter on the uh, metro system. As far as our general engagement, we've done over 100 pop-up events uh, within since September, uh, where we go to stations, uniformed officers, and our community outreach folks. And we pass out safety tips and talk to the customers as they come off the train and listen to the, what their concerns, and as well as you know police around the stations while we're there. Uh, we've also partnered with some other, other community outreach uh, folks here with Metro and uh, within the area. As we build those partnerships, we hope to get more of a team approach to community outreach and pull in more than just the police, just other services and agencies that work you know within the metropolitan region one thing we are starting uh we hope to have it up and running and beginning it in the fall as a community police academy uh, we're working right now to get the applications online so people can apply to it and then what we'll do is we'll run it it's about an eight to ten week program do it on wednesday evenings and what it is is basically a familiarization for folks that are interested in the police department and kind of see what we do here 
uh, particularly in transit police because it's such a unique uh, niche in law enforcement. So we hope to get that going by the fall. Um, on the next slide, our body-worn camera program. Uh, so we do have the cameras. We've started the training. Uh, the vendor has been here with us the last couple of weeks. Uh, we rolled it out initially to our uh, special response team and our tactical operations team. That's our bus unit as well as our SWAT team. And this week we've begun training for our District 3 officers out of Largo Town Center. Uh, we hope to have the entire program up and up, everyone up and running uh, by August 1st, which I think we'll be able to accomplish. So far, the program's gone pretty well. Uh, Axon has made this extremely user friendly. So it's just a matter of just getting the officers used to the muscle memory and turning on the cameras when, they, when they're supposed to, as well as stopping the cameras when they're supposed to. And then there's some administrative things they have to do as far as tagging the actual video uh, to match up with the incident that they, they handled. Uh, looking to issue it to the 315 officers that we have, it's about 82% of the force. Primarily, all of our patrol officers and uniformed officers, the rank of lieutenant and below, will have the body-worn cameras. The reason why I don't issue it to me, because I sit around and go to meetings all day, so, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably not the best, not the best use of our cameras, so. <laughs> And we're also, we've hired a body-worn camera uh, coordinator and manager. Uh, we're, we've hired, we, we still have one more hire to do. So the way it'll work is each coordinator, will, we have three districts. So each coordinator will be at each of the three districts. So when problems do come up with the cameras, or the officers have difficulty initially, you know, with uh, what we call tagging, matching the incident up with the report. They're there to help them through the process. So, so far, it, it's gone pretty well. But... We expect that, you know, like any program, I know uh, we put out an initial policy with the cameras out on the street. We've already had to tweak our policy a bit, and I expect that to go on probably for the next year or so as we roll this out. Just as reality meets theory and the policy, it's, we'll have to change to make sure it's practical. Our enhanced visibility uh, through the general manager, Mr. Dwyer, we've been able to enhanced visibility uh, through partnerships with uh, Metropolitan Police, uh, Chevrolet Police, Greenbelt Police, and the uh, Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority. Uh, we did have Seat Pleasant for a while, but they weren't, uh, they didn't want to continue with the program. Uh, I think they were more accustomed to, you know, doing a different type of policing than they were in transit, so they pulled out of it, so we lost them. But Alexandria is on board, so we expect to have them to start here probably within the next two weeks. And we're still working with some of our other partners to get them on board as well. A lot of the MOUs get hung up, uh, not hung up, I shouldn't say that, but they get uh, reviewed quite extensively through the various jurisdictions' legal offices. So and that's, that's sort of what <coughs> we're waiting on, just to get through that review process, which is important. I understand that. Uh, as far as our SPOs uh, that we've been able to contract with, so we're at 15 stations now. Um, we're looking to expand it to at least 25 in the district. Uh, some of the stations that we have are obviously they're listed on here. The MPD stations, what we're doing as we bring SPOs on board, we're kind of shifting some of the MPD resources to other stations on the list. And I know there's been questions on how we've chosen the stations. Well, we've chosen them based on crime, number one, and then citizen-type complaints that we get through the hotline, as well as ridership <laughs> numbers and that, things like that. And that's how we've come up with the stations. You know? So we've got the data to kind of back up why we're placing them there. Since they've started, at least around the, uh, the stations where we do have the deployed SPOs and the overtime uh, enhancement with the outside agencies, and now it's, it's only a month-to-month -month comparison, so you have to take it for what it is. But, you know, the month that we didn't have it compared to the month after we got them, there's been a 20% reduction in, in crime. So, but that's still just a month-to-month -month comparison, so we're going to have to watch that a little bit more as we go along. Oh, yep. So our progress, I talked a little bit about it. So, you know, even though our crime is up, but our enforcement's up as well. 
So if, if you look at it, actually on this slide, it's a little bit dated. It says 116%, but as of yesterday, we're up about 134% on enforcement. And that's driven primarily through arrests and uh, citations that we've been issuing. Uh, fair evasion as far as and civil citations uh, that we've done, at least for the calendar year, it's increased over last year about 420%. So we're still, you know, working through some of the uh, the issues with uh, fair evasion. I think with the general manager, Mr. Dwyer, the gates that they've installed up at uh, up at Fort Todd, I think, you know, as they're testing them, I think that's that's definitely a way to go, and I think it'll cut down on a lot of fair evasion. So, even though our crimes up, our enforcement's up as well. Next slide, gentlemen, please. Thank you, Chief. As I believe you're all aware, and as Chief just referenced, we've installed the new saloon-style fair gates at Fort Totten, and I thank Mr. Webster and his team for their leadership in this regard. Plans call for the next fair gate replacements to commence this summer with the intention of replacing gates system-wide. The change at Fort Totten has resulted in an estimated 50% reduction in fare evasion at the station. We'll continue to use the gates installed at Fort Totten and the next number of stations to evaluate additional potential improvements to the fair gate design. In addition, MTPD is getting information from Mr. Webster's performance team about periods in the day where we are experiencing higher levels of fare evasion at stations. Chief team is attempting to use that data while making fare enforcement part of the routine that patrols undertake at stations. We'll collectively work to continue to improve data-driven initiatives this data-driven initiative. Next slide, gentlemen, please. And finally, uh, Director Lowe, I appreciate your passion about this topic, and I, I think it was timely that we had this discussion based on the slide. The text My MTB PT app is an incredible means of direct communication that customers can use to immediately report unlawful or suspicious behavior. For those who have access to our Everbridge system internally, which is the means by which our control center messages out to the entirety of the organization. There are many daily occurrences of buses and trains being held due to reports by customers of suspicious or potential uh, criminal activity. Tips from our customers are anonymous and do not put the person making the report in any type of compromised position as they are not making a call, but providing the information via text. Although, although the application is well publicized and we've probably had about 1,400 um, texts this year using the app, the general manager has requested that we take further steps to ensure that all customers have access to it. So in addition to existing methods, we will be blitzing our bus, rail, and eventually our metro access fleets with new signage on the application, which in some cases will include the ability to download a URL code if the application isn't already loaded onto your phone. And this has already commenced in bus. We've actually touched buses in every division. Rail, I believe, is starting today. Metro access, we will start soon thereafter. So with that, I hope this presentation served its purpose, which was to illustrate to the board that the efforts your metro teams are undertaking to assist those most in need on our system, to be an industry leader in system security on behalf of our customers and employees, and to ensure that we use technology and our greatest asset our teammates to the maximum extent practicable in accomplishing these goals. And as with the general manager, I'd be remiss if I didn't call out Chief Enzalo for his leadership in making these goals a reality. And with that, we're very anxious and happy to take your questions or comments. Uh, thank you very much, Brian and Chief. Um, as I'm going to make one comment, then I'll turn the floor over to committee members, and then from there uh, to other board members. Uh, but as reflected in the RAC annual report that we just uh, received and read, uh, it's very clear that our community believes uh, that are they're concerned about becoming victims of crimes on our metro system. And I want to say thank you to you all. Uh, this is the second presentation we received from you, and you are demonstrating tangible progress in situational awareness, in action, and results. So thank you for that. And I'll turn the floor over to any committee member that has a comment. Thank you, Chief. Dr. Lowe. Um, Chief, could you tell me how many slots will be in the Community Police Academy? About 25 slots. That's about all we can accommodate for right now. 
And uh, is this a one-time thing, or are we thinking about running this multiple times a year or multiple years? I'd like to try to get it. Well, first of all, we'll see how the first one goes. Okay, fair enough. And then, and then if we can, run it quarterly is what we'd like to do. Yeah. Okay. Um, I now have to ask an extremely remedial question. <laughs> what is a special police officer? So a special police officer is a private security person that's armed but there are laws in all three jurisdictions that govern them. So on the property, they have the same authority to the powers of arrest that a law enforcement officer would have, but it's contained just to that property that they're actually uh, protecting. It doesn't apply to public space like streets and things like that. It's just to the property that they're protecting. And we've just, in like the last month, started using SPOs? By the last couple of months, we started when Mr. Clark and Mr. Dwyer, we had to work out a few issues uh, logistically with it. And we already had SPOs allied was our contractor. So what we did to get it started, we used the existing contract and we started putting them in place. Okay, okay. contractors basically. Okay, yes. and how many do we have now? Well, let's see. It, the number, so we have 15 stations and to make this as easy as possible because I don't want to get into how Allied manages their ships. So it's about 100 personnel on a contract. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's two special police officers at the 15 stations from opening till close. Okay. We run it. Okay. This is ringing a bell. I think I've seen them when while bobbing around. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, one point of clarification. Um, you do not need an app to use my MT tech to text my oh, MTPD. I just Thank want you. everyone to be clear. Um, you can literally just save those six digits in the contacts in your phone and then text, just text it like you're texting a person and someone will respond almost right away. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Mr. Letourneau. Just, Chief, could you just discuss for a minute the correlation or relationship between fare evasion and um, other crimes on the system that are more serious? and maybe the individuals um, who partake in those crimes. Yeah, I mean, what we've seen over the years, uh, there is a direct co correlation. I think Mr. Clark, and I don't want to steal his phrase, but he says not everybody that fare evades is a criminal, but all criminals fare evade for the most part. Most of the individuals we can encounter in serious crimes, the ones that we arrest, and I have to give credit to our investigative team, our detectives, because they close on a large number of the cases that occur on Metro, which is also due to the great video system that we do have. Uh, but just about, you know, uh, don't keep me to this, but I would say in 99.5% of the time, the person that committed what we call a part one crime is ferrovated into the system. So in other words, if we were to be able to continue to eradicate fare evasion, we would likely be reducing the number of crimes as a whole and criminals on the system. That's one strategy, yes. OK, thank you. Ms. Babers. Um, thank you all for this presentation. So you know, recently, I'm sure you're aware there's been media news as it relates to the fact that in the, in the district, fair evasion is decriminalized. And there has been um, talk that you all and the police officers cannot request identification. Can you just provide some clarity to what you all currently do? Yes. So, and I'm not a lawyer, so don't hold me to that either. So, but basically the way the law that, that was, that's written you know, uh, and that was passed, you know, by the legislative body is we can consensually ask you to stop and, you know, consensually ask you for ID. But if you know the law, you can walk right past us and we can't forcibly stop you and we can't do that. Where in Maryland or Virginia, for instance, like Montgomery County, you know, initially it's civil, it's a civil citation, but there's also in their, and I, don't quote me on this, but just in my terms, they also have the authority, the person, the citizen has to cooperate with the police officer in writing the citation. And I think that's what the law in the district allows. I, I don't want to speak for any attorneys, but that's my understanding of it. Okay, so just for clarity, it's not that you all are not, you know, asking for identification. 
there's just nothing you can do if they refuse to provide it. That's correct. And the other thing, part of it too is, you know, by not, let's say we stopped them, you know, I try to get consent, but then we tell them to leave. So if we tell them to leave and they leave, they're gone. So what it also does too, when we do that initial stop, if we had the authority to do that, we could run the person's name through. And generally when we do run persons that are through that we stop in Maryland or Virginia, they usually come back with warrants. I could, Thank you. I, I, I just had a comment to that because I think this is a, a crucial point and you know, there has been a little coverage on that because you know, I, 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 in some interviews I was trying to give context to kind of what the chief has been talking to me about. So again, the police asked for identification, but someone could, you know, in theory say, I'm Donald Duck. And, and the, right now the police have no ability to actually enforce that piece. So what I said, and I, and, you know, I think this is, you know, at least speaking for me as a general manager, I, I don't think we're advocating to go back to collection. It's not that someone that, you know, would we want the $2? Yes, that's not the piece. The piece is we want to have people that potentially could hurt people not on the system. And so I gave an example at a meet, meet the team event in Boston two weeks ago, someone fairvated, so now in Virginia, the officer stopped that individual. They, were, they got identification, and the person had two outstanding warrants for uh, violent assault. So they put him in handcuffs, and he got arrested. So that was an individual that obviously is wanted for assault. Yesterday, I happened to be at Fort Totten. Someone was smoking, came through the station. I actually just ran into one of the chief's captains who runs that in district. He's uh, just an incredible officer. He's actually out riding trains to check in on his officers and others, and he came up, and someone was smoking, and he asked the person for ID. Interesting, in this case, the person had a resume in their hand, and so the and so then he had a multi-jurisdictional warrant uh, wanted for him, and he went under arrest. So he didn't get arrested for smoking. He got citation for smoking, but he got arrested because he had an outstanding warrant in multiple jurisdictions, and the reason he was able to do that is because uh, they stopped them for the smoking. So it, I think it comes back to our code of conduct is about fair evasion, it's about smoking, it's about all these behaviors that the RAC has mentioned. You know, I think what we would probably want to have some discussions with the district about is how do we just have the, I, the true, I think it's called real ID or real name associated in the law. So if you're doing those incidents and you're stopped, we can at least check you for warrants. And if you don't have any warrants, you're going to get the regular civil citation and go about your day. If you have warrants, we want to remove violent and people that are trying to harm people off the system. And so that's that's what the chief, I think, uh, you know, and, and others are, have been talking about. Sorry, I just so just to follow up, just to make sure that I understand um, everything that we just learned, which this is really helpful. Thanks for raising this. Like, it's a legislative fix around, like, I mean, if you're going to write someone, like, you don't write the citation to Donald Duck, right? I, like, we, even if it's just about writing a civil citation for fair evasion, like, even if it's not about this other stuff, you still, like, need to know the name to issue the citation to. Uh, that's correct. It's, yeah. It's the chief point right now. Uh, okay. So we, we just need to fix that. Yes. And, yeah. Pat, you know, our, our Patty, our general counsel, would have the specific language. Um, I'm sure. I'm so confident that lawyers are going to help us fix this. Yeah. It, they're going to be a key part. A key part of this team, but this is this is fixable. It is. It's a hundred percent fixable. Yeah. Okay. Great. And again, and, and, I, and, I, and to me, it's how do we? I think we want to really lean to. Um, there are people that hurt people in society, and I think we want to keep those individuals off of our public transit system. And we're hearing that overwhelmingly from everyone, whether it's our, the rack, all of our customer survey research. Uh, you name it, that is, this is the number one topic. And, and, and actually on our data, it's the number one topic in DC more than it is in Maryland and Virginia. So people in DC actually want us to, to work on public safety even more than the other two jurisdictions. And, and this is an easy fix. We're going to get this done. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate the support. OK, thank you. So uh, thank you for another great presentation. And I will close with one comment. And that comment is one, uh, I think tonight. Director Drummond, five, yes. would it be possible for me to also make a comment before you close absolutely, out? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, sir. 
Uh, I just wanted to speak as a law enforcement family. I think that the work that you guys are doing is brilliant. I love the diversity in the youth team. I love the fact that you are willing to partner with other services and agencies, that you're not just going for a one fix, that I'm looking forward to seeing the restorative justice program being implemented into what we are doing. And I just wanted to appreciate and say thank you for all the work that you guys are doing and putting forth and making sure that we are doing a comprehensive and a holistic look at safety and service here on Metro and WMATA. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ms. Thanks, Vice Chair. Vice Chair. I, and I'll make closing comments uh, that are aligned with hers. Uh, the Youth Advisory Council. Uh, you meet once a month from 5 to 7 p.m. I had the honor of participating in your last meeting in March. Um, there is one today, correct? in this room. Uh, it's a sight to behold if you want to see young people engage with law enforcement officials, key staff members from Metro, and generally someone from the outside who is providing them some educational information. It's robust and it's very interactive. So thank you for leaning forward in touching the youth who are the future of our Metro ridership uh, down the line. Uh, thank you, sir. And just one plug for tonight. So we will have some of the commanders here. So that's the, those will be our guest speakers. Fantastic. Chad, I won't make a comment about you being a Cowboys fan. <laughs> <laughs>